Hi. So I'm here, obviously, to talk to you about algorithmic light art. Now, I started a few years ago just doing the standard Arduino and a strip of NeoPixels um, kind of desktop projects in order to kind of take some cool stuff to festivals and make my room a bit livelier. And I'm incapable of stopping doing anything, so I kept escalating. And I'm going to take you through first a couple of pictures of things that I've made or have collaborated on. So this is the first one. This is um, at an event called Rumpus in London a, a couple of years ago. These are basically the standard RGB LEDs you get, except on strings rather than on strip, which means you can drape them over places. Now, you can get these just off AliExpress, and it's a very good way to kind of make the installation 3D and make it fill a space. Um, another one we've got here is these are... The cores of these are custom PCBs, which are pentagonal, each of which has five LEDs on. And they're arranged in a dodecahedron. And I've done the geometry to spherically, to, to map the coordinate. Uh, this has less of the lanterns in than I recalled. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I've done the geometry to map them into spherical coordinate space. So each of the lanterns has basically a very low res projector in the center of it, meaning we can do sort of animations on the outside of the icosahedron lanterns. Um, they are an absolute bear to set up, I have to tell you, but uh, they're very rewarding. Um, and this is uh, one of my latest projects with my partner, Dee, who's over there. Uh, these are laser-cut lanterns, which we beveled, and they're frosted acrylic with patterns cut through them, so you get a kind of mixture of hard and soft light and they project patterns onto the flat surfaces around them. The, a lot of what I've found makes a project really kind of stand out is not the, not the LEDs themselves, but the kind of um, the diffusion and the, how sensitively they're built to work with the environment. So when I started doing these, I thought, I just want to make light stuff. And in the way that hobbies tend to, it broke down into kind of two things which I didn't really enjoy doing, which were power engineering and algorithm design, uh, neither of which I was particularly talented at. But uh, hopefully I'll be able to talk you through some of the early mistakes I made to help you know where to start. So. In terms of basic system architecture, and I'll just touch on this briefly, you've either got a microcontroller-based system. This is your classic Arduino and a strip of NeoPixels uh, with nothing else in the system. It's very easy to get started with. Uh, it features in a lot of the kind of basic tutorials that you get. When you're troubleshooting them, there's very few things you need to worry about because it's just a sort of two-stage system. You can um, tap the signal line with an oscilloscope or just a uh, multimeter and listen to see if it's buzzing, to see if you've got a bitstream going on the signal line. Um, one thing is if you want to have them reacting to real-world stimuli or if you want to do a lot of sort of spatialization or on-the-fly generation of patterns, you end up quickly running out of compute space or compute capacity and memory space. So the next thing up is in the most general terms, putting a PC um, in line with a microcontroller. So the PC is running the sort of control software that generates what each LED should be showing. And it's sending then frames to a microcontroller, which does the real-time um, rendering for the uh, bitstream for the LEDs. Because um, depending on your level of experience with this sort of thing, it may be incredibly obvious, but a PC can't do the precise timing that the LEDs require. This gives you the advantage that you can, like, just plug a connect in via USB, or you can sort of um, code in Python, which after dealing with um, endless hours of seg faults and array out of bound errors in C and C++, I found a great relief. Um, the next thing to think about when you're specking up a system is what type of LEDs you have. So there's the basic RGB ones. These are the kind of stock Adafruit NeoPixel 
type. They've got three color channels. They take three bytes per pixel in the bit stream. Uh, they're very good. They give really kind of rich, bright colors. They're very well documented, but they're quite bad at pastels. And they're really, really bad at atmospheric lighting because when you try and mix white, each LED has a sort of up to 10% variance in its response on the different channels, and each of the channels is different with respect to all the other channels. So when you try and mix white, you end up with this kind of each LED being a slightly different not white, and it always makes me feel like I'm drunk at the dentist, which is not an experience I really want um, at any time. Uh, so I like to use RGBWs, and these are quite, quite simply, they've just got a fourth channel, which is a white or a warm white LED. And there's a simple algorithm for converting RGB to RGBW, which is you take the minimum of the three channels, you subtract that from those three channels, and you assign it to the white channel. And that gives you as much white as you want uh, with the kind of higher precision of mixing in the other colors to get really nice sort of natural tones or pastels. And even kind of further down that line, you've got WWA pixels, which are not a wrestling league. They, um, it's white, warm white, and amber. Or sometimes you get cool white, neutral white, warm white, and amber. And it's for mixing very precise kinds of natural lighting. And I've always wanted to do a fire animation with them, because I like doing fire animations more than I like doing anything else, really. Uh, and because they've got a much narrower color range and the same kind of signal parameter space, you get much, much finer gradations in what colors you can use. So you, um, yeah, I'm very excited, but I haven't actually done anything with them. Um, if you are building a system that's at all non-trivial, uh, I recommend in the most strong possible terms that you set up a simulation. So um, open pixel control is one of the libraries that sends to uh, Fade Candy. It runs very nicely on a Pi and it comes with a bundled simulator. So this means that when you're setting up the system, uh, you can first test what the computer thinks it should be doing separately from testing what the hardware is actually doing. And that kind of separation kind of halves or better the inevitable debugging time. So you can, it's also very good for developing patterns because you don't need to sort of set up the system, make sure that the power is working, crank your head back in your chair and look at the LEDs that are strung all over your living room and blind yourself endlessly trying to kind of tweak the exact fading from white through pink into blue of that edge of the pattern. And yes, I strongly recommend uh, going that route. This, of course, if it's going to simulate where all the LEDs are, it needs to know where they are. So generally, the way I go about this is like, if one project I did this summer had hexagonal strings of bunting that were tiered. And so it's quite trivial in Python to say, OK, I've got this many LEDs, and they're on a hexagon. So each LED, the, the hexagons have this major diameter and this height. So in Python, I can work out uh, where each LED is. And you can then sort of estimate the swag in the strings. So you can say, OK, so it's this plus um, some function of sign, which I've forgotten because I'm incredibly socially anxious and don't talk on stage very much. Um, anyway, I, so yes, you, you generate a JSON file, which has a linear list of uh, point definitions and feed that to the simulator and it makes your life a lot easier. Now, gamma correction. This is um, a very, the solution is very simple. The reasoning is unreasonably complicated. So the way your eye perceives dis differences in levels of brightness is nonlinear. The same difference at a bright, um, like 
uh, 10 lumen reduction in a bright light uh, is barely noticeable, and in a low light, it's incredibly significant. So, if you, as the LEDs have a linear response, if you fade linearly, like 255, 254, 253, then it will look like it accelerates and kind of plunges into blackness very suddenly at the end, which is very kind of, it just feels off if you've got something like a classic sparkle pattern. It looks nice if they sort of taper gently into the background color. So there is one right way to do this, which is that precious gem in software. And it's just to use a lookup table. So for example, you've got a 255 byte array and each the index of each byte is the input value, the effective brightness you want to transmit and the contents of that slot in the array is the brightness level you should set the LED to in order to get that brightness. Uh, the NeoPixels library examples have a, um, a table you can crib from and example code. It's very simple. Now, color schemes. The best thing about RGB LEDs is that they are RGB. The second best thing is that they are LEDs. Um, so we want to make glowing projects that people come up and compliment us on. And so this means they need to sort of stand out. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to go about this. And I've realized at this very moment that I've put them in a slightly unintuitive order, so I will need you to bear with me. Um, the first thing a lot of people think of is just picking random colors. So it's very computationally simple. The algorithm is very intuitive. You just, for each pixel that you have, for each channel that the pixel has, you pick a number between 0 and 255 with linear probability. Um, it's all right, I guess. It kind of, it gives you something that shows off the capacity of the LEDs. It gives you something which kind of shows off what you made, but it's a bit kind of tacky and noisy and feels not put together as expressed in meme format in the last two bullet points. Uh, this is a simulation of that. Now, this is the uh, open pixel control simulator I was talking to you about. Um, you can see, like, it looks a bit like analog video noise, and that's basically because that's what it is. It's kind of, yeah, it's pretty, but we can, we can do better than that. So, the next thing to do is to have a color you want them to be a bit like, and for each pixel, for each channel, you pick a number on a Gaussian distribution around that channel's value in the target color. So a very cheap way to do this if you're on a microcontroller is to pick a linear, a linear probability, pick a number from a range where the center of the range is the target color, do that several times and average them out, and if you do it sort of three or four times, then that approximates a Gaussian distribution with very low kind of cycle cost. Um, that would have been a very good thing to put the code up on the slide, but I did not. Uh, so you can have the mean color shift over time. So if you're using a palette, uh, which I will be talking about in the next two slides, then you can have it kind of, rather than having it a smooth gradient of the palette colors, you can have them sort of near the palette colors, and this gives it a much more kind of organic, dynamic feeling rather than just being a static display. Um, uh, things you can do with this is you can tweak over time or modulate or oscillate the standard deviation, which means that they get more and less like the central color over time. Um, this is an example of that, and like hopefully you can see, I'm not sure how well that's showing up on the background, but it's kind of, it feels themed. And the theme is obviously like a psychedelic opium den, but that is weirdly nine times out of 10 
a fairly safe place to start. So, like, these, these are all approximating the same color, uh, which is the header color from my slides. And they've got a sort of standard deviation of 32, I think. So it's kind of off into pink and off into sort of peach and red. And yeah. The next thing is palettes. So obviously a palette is a, an array with a bunch of color values in that typically fade one to the next. So if you just display consecutive um, values from the palette on a strip of LEDs, you will get that nice sort of ubiquitous rainbow effect. Um, pretty much all the libraries come with a couple of quite good palettes built in. Like, they look really nice. The one you will have seen is the rainbow one, which comes with pretty much everything because it's easy to make a rainbow. And another one you might have seen is there's a good sort of purple and indigo and orange one that comes with fast lead that I've seen a lot at um, kind of regional Burning Man events. Um, they look good, but everybody uses them. And it's kind of a shame if you've made, for example, a 40-foot motorized uh, light-up fire-breathing anglerfish to just sort of slap a test card on the side. And even more importantly, the people you really want to impress, who are the other nerds, will think less of you for it. <laughs> Rightly. Now, the way I like to go is uh, custom palettes. So this is obviously palettes which are custom, uh, which you've defined yourself. Now, when I first started doing these, I would go into a paint program, choose a color I liked, find a hex code, feed it into a Python script, linearly interpolate between a bunch of hex codes that I want. It was awful. Uh, so. I realized that the right way to do it, and this is another one of those gems where there is one right way to do it, is to open up like Photoshop or GIMP or MS Paint or whatever your jam is and paint a palette. And this means you can kind of keep an eye to keeping the kind of luminance of the colors approximately the same. Because if you, if you have a color that goes a little bit darker or a little bit brighter, that's way, way more obvious on LEDs, which are much brighter than it is on um, a screen. So use with caution. Um, you then save that as something sensible, like a PNG or a bitmap, and you write a Python script which iterates over the first row. So I tend to do mine sort of 20 by 2,000 or 100 by 2,000, and iterates over the first row, gets the pixel color of each pixel, and then writes that into a header file. You can tweak it to result in the same or a custom size for the output header. And you just use sort of string formatting to produce the header. Um, it's very simple. Um, the, there is an example up on my GitHub, but it's hidden in a last minute anxiety attack of a repository. So I might uh, skip over that for now. Here is an example of that. You can see along the top is the palette I've painted. And you can also see the center of the canvas there is lagging a bit behind the edge. So it looks like the colors are kind of shrinking into the middle. And so we've got an offset in the palette, which is um, linear different distance from the middle, which is just Pythagoras and an offset, which is how much time has passed. And you kind of just add those together and it'll get you a gradient over the course, over the uh, area of your canvas, which is moving. Um, so I would now like to talk about how I go about building an algorithm over time, because it's one of the least kind of intuitive things I found about the whole business. So the obvious thing to start with for me is a sparkle pattern, because the sparkle pattern looks good on everything. It's quite intuitively linear. So the basic algorithm is you have a buffer which has the pixel colors. Um, each frame 
you check to see whether there should be a sparkle this frame. So you say sparkle chance is 0 0.025. Um, and if a random number between 0 and 1 is less than 0 0.025, you spawn a new sparkle and you pick a random pixel for it to be in. You pick a color based on where you are in the palette or however you're picking your color scheme. And then there's two basic ways of implementing this. If you're on something where computing power is quite um, limited or specifically something without a floating point unit, you want to have um, set the values directly in a pixel channel buffer and kind of reduce down to a minimum of either zero or whatever background color you want each channel in each pixel every frame. So at the beginning of each frame, you just decrement all the values by two, unless that takes it below zero. Um, or if you're on a PC and aura feeling fancy, you can just record the time, the last sparkle time in each, uh, for each pixel and um, what color um, it was. And then each, each frame for each pixel for each channel, that channel is uh, one over the elapsed time times the channel value of the original color. So it's basically an inverse square reduction or an inverse reduction over time. Um, this is a, an example of that implementation. You can see that when a sparkle starts, it's a very hard cut on and they're kind of fading. If you keep your eye on one pixel, you can see how they sort of fade into the background. And a nice example of the kind of multiplying different size channels or different magnitude channels by the same less than one value is you get slight chromatic shift as they fade, which makes it feel kind of, again, organic and rich in a way that the linear fade isn't. Um, but I don't really like the hard flickering. It feels kind of jarring in a way that if you're making kind of, for example, lighting for a space in which people are monged out routinely, um, it's a bit much, it's a bit hectic. So I like to do a low pass filter, which a bunch of you will know about. But for those of you who may not, it basically, it smooths out higher frequency signals. So things that happen very fast don't get through and things that happen very slowly don't get through. Now, those of you who do know what a low pass filter is, please forgive how badly I butchered that explanation. But concretely, what we do is we keep two buffers, one with the calculated value that we received in the last um, example, and one which is the display buffer. So each frame, the display buffer equals, say, 0 0.9 times itself plus 0 0.1 times the rendering buffer, which means that everything fades in and fades out smoothly uh, for the cost of one floating point or two floating point multiplications per pixel per frame, <coughs> um, per channel per pixel per frame. And this is good because it gives us a bunch of free stuff, which I'm always keen for. It, when you switch patterns, it doesn't just jolt straight to something else. It kind of linearly fades between the two. And when you're turning it on and when you're turning it off, it kind of fades in and fades out. And another thing you can do with this is you can modulate the mixing factor over time so you can make it more soft and smooth and more kind of sharp and crisp on either with a slider or in response to the beat of the music or in response to some other thing. Um, a nice thing to do is to hook a connect up and to sort of just take the average amount of movement in the space and when there's more, more movement have the pattern be sort of hotter and more hectic and when there's less movement have it softer and slower. Um, here is a uh, simulation of that and you can see that it feels much kind of gentler. Um, yeah, one downside of doing this kind of thing is I usually 
when I'm trying something out, I will just bring it up on the screen for a couple of seconds to check how it looks, and then I will hypnotize myself and discover I have been staring at it for half an hour, and my tea's gone cold, and I'm late for work. Uh, so, another thing, another reason I like the fancy um, time fading rather than value fading algorithm for Sparkle is it lets you control the flow of time within the program. So you can, instead of calling time directly, you can just feed a value which represents the effective time. And each frame, you take the value of, say, the potentiometer uh, as cast to zero to one, and you multiply that by the actual elapsed time since the last frame, and you add that to the effective time, which means if the potentiometer is at zero, you add zero, so time has stopped. And if it's at four, because um, obviously I said zero to four, not zero to one. Um, if it's at four, then time is going four times as fast as it would have done. This means that you can kind of, if you just multiply the time value by that factor, then you end up shuttling backwards and forwards in time, and that breaks a lot of things, um, unless you spend hours programming for it, which I will not. Um, so. This is uh, obviously a different layout. This is the simulator for the icosahedron lanterns you saw at the start of the talk. Um, and this is, you can see they're stopped now. And this is going on a sort of 24-second um, period sine wave. Um, so it's a very kind of easy and very cheap, once you're doing all the other algorithms, way of um, tweaking the kind of feel of an installation in real time. Um, now, once you've got the Sparkle pattern implemented, you can try doing a bunch of different things. Like I said earlier that you can um, combine the position in time and the position in space of each pixel to get a, uh, a point in the palette to sample. Um, you can, instead of using the sparkle to generate differences in brightness, use the sparkle to generate uh, a value that you either add to or subtract from the effective position in the palette. So you can see this seems very kind of smooth and normal when there's not much color change happening, but when there's a sudden change, it sort of shimmers, and it makes it feel dynamic and reactive when it's actually just uh, a kind of static algorithm. Um, another thing you can do, now I'm not going to go through the implementation of this because it was a nightmare and I don't want to, but instead of having a kind of linear buffer that says this one last, last sparkled at this time, you have a dynamically sized array which has spark events which have time and color and the time is used to generate uh, where on the string it is and where on the string it is, is used to generate kind of how bright the LED should be of that color. And so if it's before, before the position on the string, it's no, no brightness. And if it's after the position on the string, it's an inverse uh, decrease. And each string has its own dynamically sized array. And you can just, you just run over all the events in that array and add them all linearly to the point of the LED, um, to, to the color of the LED, or you take the maximum. Um, one thing I discovered is it's very important when you're doing something with dynamic event spawning to check when the event is no longer having an effect and delete it, because otherwise your program gets slower and slower and slower, and you feel like you're dying, and then eventually you figure out what's wrong. So a slightly more straightforward algorithm, which now I think about it, it would have been a very good idea to do first, is one I call the Wobbler, because it's based on a quite intense evening I had with this album, um, both listening to it and staring intently at the album cover. Um, I'm not easy to live with, really. Um, so it's kind of in this instance, what I wanted was a radial arrangement of LEDs with a line around them, sort of wobbling, with the colors smearing out. So 
what we need to do is we need to break that down into steps. We need, so a radial arrangement, we uh, generate that quite trivially in Python, and we feed it to the open pixel control uh, simulator. Then we want to circle halfway down the strands. Okay, so that's clearly a, a radius, um, which we can generate in two dimensions or three dimensions. And we define the brightness of the LEDs by the uh, inversely to the distance from that radius on either side. So now we've got a circle, and it's white because all the channels are the same. Um, now we want the line to wobble, so we modulate the radius um, with a sine wave based on um, position in time plus strand index. So we can, I liked the um, three sine waves because it gives a kind of triscal uh, effect. So you now have a line that wobbles, which, great, good start. And we now want to um, have the colors split out, which once the line's wobbling, it's very simple to add or subtract a value to, the, um, to two of the color channels or to multiply them by different factors so that the sine waves don't quite line up and it goes into an out of phase, which will hopefully be much clearer to look at than it was to hear. But we can see they're um, kind of falling in and out of phase. And this is sort of a 10 meter diameter installation that you saw in the first slide with a picture that's over a dance floor. And it's quite good, but it's, uh, it's a bit boring. So the first thing I thought to do was to say, OK, so we've, we're modulating a bunch of things. Uh, the chromatic aberration factors are remaining static. So maybe modulate them on a sine wave as well. And this is an idiom that I come across again and again in this kind of thing, where it's just a case of adding enough simple perturbations to the system to give the impression that it's much more complicated than it is. So there's kind of a, a balancing point where you reach the limit of people's, the average person's ability to pick factors out of a pattern. And you go a little bit beyond that. So like factors of um, the system keep leaping out and disappearing again, uh, but you don't go too far so that the system just seems chaotic and nonsensical. And that kind of is the best point for giving people a, uh, like, crunchy is the only word I can think of, which is not the word I'm after, a uh, intellectually kind of engaging experience with your um, psychedelic club lighting. So uh, I really like the way this turned out because it kind of gives you a nice sort of negative space uh, hypnotized again, a nice negative space rotating Triscoll in the middle that gets more rounded and more kind of pointy over time. But it does spend a lot of time in white, which is a lot more galling when you're talking about 320 LEDs than it is uh, talking about pixels on a screen. Because again, these are RGBs because you can't get the RGBWs in strand format. Um, they have told me to stop asking. Um, <laughs> so you end up with that weird dentisty white light kind of washing over the dance floor every three or four minutes, and then suddenly everybody's um, looks a lot less interesting. So the next thing I wanted to do was to kind of modulate the diameter. So it kind of shoots out from the middle, like you're being abducted by aliens, and it wobbles about a bit, and then it shoots back into the middle. And when it's in the middle, we can uh, twiddle around or swap about the uh, chromatic aberration factors, which means it looks like it's a different set of shifting colors each time. So um, that's how this one looks. Um, and we end up sort of with a very dynamic, um, quite immersive experience because it's shooting out over your head and it's circling around you so it kind of draws you in in a way that just sort of sparkly lights do not which is sometimes what you're after and sometimes not and so the basic overall 
protocol is to start by trying to imagine what you want them to look like, either by coming up with it on your own or by ripping something off wholesale. Because as you've seen over the course of this last example, when you rip something off wholesale with this kind of system, by the time you've approximated it in software and then tweaked it so it doesn't look awful and then kind of rendered it over a quite sparse LED arrangement, it bears little to no resemblance to the thing you started out trying to rip off. So you get a lot of leeway there. You then kind of, like with any software, try and break it down into intuitive stages, like the, the classic how to draw an owl picture, draw two circles, draw the rest of the owl. Um, and then again, try and find a balance between predictability and chaos. Now, I would now like to show you what I spent last winter doing, which is by far the most overcomplicated thing I have ever done. Um, so this is the control system for the lighting for a geodesic dome. And it's for, it was for Burning Nest, but it was also taken to nowhere this year. And it's something like 2,000 LEDs. And the, this bit in the middle is a projection screen, uh, which is projected on from above. And the reason I decided to do this all from one piece of software, which is way more trouble than it was worth, was because I wanted this kind of trick here where the LEDs are set from the uh, screen. So you don't need to generate a color scheme and you don't need to generate patterns. You just need to find sort of VJ clips that work well, um, which was mostly because I was bored of writing patterns um, and I'd run out of ideas, uh, but I'd already been given funding for the project. So um, we've got here on the bunting, you can see there's a smooth palette display, and that's the palette that's kind of in the camp's theme colors, and you can swap between concentric or radial, um, and it's quite nice. Uh, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the psychedelic dance floor, which was that I first wrote the video rendering pattern, and I wrote the sparkle pattern, um, and I tested it with the power distribution, fine, took it to the site. Somebody said, I need to run workshops in here. We need a less confusing lighting pattern. So I thought, ah, that's very simple. I'll just write a smooth palette generation, a smooth palette renderer. Now, this takes about five times as much power as either of the other patterns. So the power supply blew up and I had to Amazon Prime one out into the middle of Devon. Uh, and so we were rigging for five days of a seven day event, but it worked nearly flawlessly the next time. And this is the uh, sparkle pattern you can see, and you'll notice that has the low pass filter I was talking about earlier. Now, the low pass filter was very, very important for setting it from the screen, because when you've got a, a line moving across the screen, when you're rendering that over a sparse grid of bright LEDs, that turns into a million tiny flashing very bright lights which is not my jam and so the a quite aggressive low pass filter means that whatever you put on the screen you end up with a kind of smooth pattern um, and i think that's about all i've got time for thank you very much Uh, yes, um, now you mention it, I am taking questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah. So I have two actually. One of them is whether you have ever run into problems with gamma correction, um, um, essentially um, being quantized and essentially losing your resolution as you're getting dark. 
So when you have a relatively slow um, fade to dark, you would end up essentially with col color steps as you're fading to dark. Yeah. So the way I deal with that is I um, do the gamma correction at the very last stage before transmitting the bitstream. So when you're transmitting it, you have um, 256 possible values, and they map nearly uniquely to 256 other possible values. And uh, on one project I did, I ended up generating a 1024 value gamma table, and it wasn't enough better to be worth it. So, uh, not really. So, and the other question is, do you ever use, well, more perceptually uniform color spaces for interpolation and such? So, CIE XYZ, for example. Uh, sorry, can you say that last bit again? So, do you ever use other color spaces like CIE XYZ? Uh, yes, I. Um, HSI is the one that makes most sense for this kind of thing because it's um, it's the intensity that's most obvious. Um, I use that sometimes, but I think. I'm now kind of used to generating those effects in RGB, and it means if you're on a microcontroller, you need a sort of ARM Cortex rather than a 80 mega 32U or whatever. And it's, uh, I used to, I've kind of stopped. It'd probably be a good idea to work in those spaces. Um, that's not a very satisfying answer. I'm sorry. Does anybody else have a question? Yes. You mentioned uh, RGBW um, and the warm and cool white. Um, what is cool versus warm white? Which, which one is your preference? Okay, so cool white is um, slightly towards the blue spectrum. Uh, neutral mm -hmm. white is kind of as close to the middle as possible, and warm white is sort of into the red orange. So, like, these lights are slightly warm. Uh, fluorescent light bulbs are slightly warm. Uh, no, incandescent light bulbs are slightly warm. Fluorescent light bulbs are slightly cool. I really, really like the warm white. Even, like, it's possible to write algorithms that map perfectly using those by sort of um, anticipating what um, proportional channels they use and kind of dividing that into the um, into the target value rather than just finding the minimum, but I really like the way it kind of just shifts everything to be a bit warmer. Thank you, and thanks for the talk. That's absolutely fine. Anyone else? Yes. Hey, I really enjoyed your talk, and the installations look great. Um, I was wondering what the uh, breakout boards look like for some of these installations, because you've got so many LEDs. I kind of. I so, the, um, the biggest one at the end, I just do sort of um, the Octo WS2811 breakout board for TeenC is a standard available one that has two Ethernet jacks, uh, which each of which has four pairs of uh, signal and isolated ground. And I broke that out to an um, Ethernet switch front panel. Um, which was a way more complicated way of doing it than was necessary or desirable. Um, the icosahedron ones um, breakout, that was kind of one of the first projects I did, and the breakout board was just an enormous thing of strip board with very fat solder traces down it to carry the power lines. Um, if you catch up with me later, I'm camped over in accessible camping, and we've got one of the little uh, lanterns that you saw in the third slide with us, if I can find an extension cable that is exactly one meter longer. So uh, I'll probably be hanging around there if you want to come talk to me about that later. Cool. Uh, there's one more question over there. Uh, hi, it, um, it, it's a great talk. Thanks very much. Um, it is much a comment. I'd have thought that for your low pass filter, you don't need floats. You should be able to do everything with fixed point and integer maths, shouldn't you? Uh, Which could, means you could do it on a microcontroller. Yes, true. I've uh, 
always left it too late. Okay. And I've never taken the time to figure out how to use a fixed point library, but that is entirely accurate. Yes. Okay. I'll have a chat with you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Oh, wait. Oh, no. Yeah. I was wondering. Well, uh, if <laughs> okay. So uh, I was wondering if you needed. I'm um, okay. Cool. Is this on? Ah. Hmm. I guess we're done. Thank you very yeah. much, Cass. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, festival.